The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. It had to happen quickly. They did a tremendous job doing that. Right now on Politics Now, Nevada Senator Jackie Rosen talks to us about Afghanistan, what she asked our country's top generals, and what she hopes happens this week. Politics has gone super polarized, um, hyper-partisan, and on Capitol Hill. Is Nevada seeing the rise of the independent voter? We look at why a growing number of people are signing up to vote as nonpartisan. One October is a lingering presence. It's four years since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. The new effort by Nevada Democrats to get rid of the bump stocks used in the one October shooting. From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now. A government shutdown is averted for now. Thanks for joining us here on Politics Now. I'm David Charns. And I'm Vanessa Murphy. John is off today. A temporary funding bill will keep the government up and running until December 3rd. The short-term bill includes funding to resettle Afghan refugees and deliver disaster relief to states. Fifteen Republicans, including Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, voted in support of the bill. Do our part to avoid a shutdown. This is a good outcome, one I'm happy we are getting done. Nevada's entire delegation voted for the short-term bill. Attention now turns to a debate over whether to raise the debt ceiling. If they remain deadlocked, the government could go into default, essentially making it unable to pay bills. And fighting among Democrats, threatening to sink President Biden's domestic agenda. And it's also facing opposition from House Republicans. The majority of overwhelming amount of our members are going to vote no because they don't view it as an infrastructure bill. There is a two trillion dollar gap in just how much each side is willing to spend and progressives will not support this infrastructure bill on its own saying it actually has negative effects on climate. Now when it goes over to the Senate it's also just seems doomed to fail. I talked with Nevada Democratic Senator Jackie Rosen about the bill and Afghanistan. First I asked her about her questions to the top generals during a hearing this week. What was the response you got and were you satisfied with the answers that, oh, well, we know, you know, more now than we did then and, you know, we didn't necessarily think there would be a terror attack, you know, were you satisfied with the answers you got? So let's be clear that the Doha agreement was made in the spring of 2020 by former President Trump. And so I believe, as was testified to, alluded to today by the uh, generals and, the, uh, of course, the defense secretary, that American lives, American men and women in uniform and others may have been in harm's way had we extended past the August 31st deadline. Therefore, we quickly had to marshal all of our resources uh, to do that massive evacuation. Like I said, over 124,000 individuals. That's still ongoing for uh, anyone that wants to um, be evacuated to safety. Our office, our, our our offices, all the Senate offices, I would imagine, across the country working with Department of State and others in order to ensure that safe passage for anyone that remains. And so I think that it had to happen quickly. They did a tremendous job doing that. There are a lot of lessons to be learned uh, and a lot of takeaways. And this is just the first step in those hearings to get to the bottom of that. The infrastructure plan, um, which obviously was passed in, in, in your body, um, are you frustrated with what's happening on the other side of the, of the Capitol building, and, and are you hopeful that this will move forward in the days to come? I can tell you that I was part of the Infrastructure 22, that group of 22 senators that negotiated this terrific bipartisan package. The Senate did their job. We passed it in a bipartisan fashion, and I'm hoping that this week the House will do the same. The American people are counting on them. Is there something in there that's really important to Southern Nevada to, to keep us going? I know there aren't a lot of specifics in there saying, hey, you know, we're going to do this, do that. It's a lot of, you know, broadband, roads, airports, but is there something you want to see that with that money? 
I was on the airport and broadband infrastructure uh, subcommittees doing that negotiation. So let's talk about airports. We know that we'll take the airport, uh, Southern Nevada, right here, McCarran Airport, now Harry Reid International Airport. We had over 50 million tourists come through there, I believe, in 2019. Of course, 2020 with COVID, the number's a little bit different. But we know that not just for our airport, but for airports across this country, it's critical that we allow them to upgrade their technology for the control tower. Those control towers keep us all safe in the skies. We need to be sure, we've learned in the pandemic, that we need reliable internet in every home in America for telework, for teleeducation, for telehealth. I'm gonna talk about tourism again. You wanna book that great Nevada vacation somewhere? You might use the internet for that. What about all those small businesses that still wanna sell their goods and services? You need the internet, internet for that as well. So we need to be sure that we have robust, reliable internet all across our country. Nevada, of course, really we have some real rural communities. They need that help, and we are going to get it to them. And, of course, we'll put that full interview on 8newsnow.com. Once again, Nevada will be in the national spotlight in the 2022 election, and the state is seeing a growing trend of nonpartisan registrations. Reporter Kate Houston went to UNLV to talk to people signing up to vote. You want your voice heard. Everyone really wants that at the end. Students at UNLV spent the afternoon registering to vote. I feel like voting is like very important, especially if you want to make a change in today's society. So it's really nice that they're here to help me get my voice out there. The university sponsored many nonpartisan registration booths. And we've had a bit of buzz, uh, so we're hoping for about uh, maybe 150, 200 folks to register through us. Active voting numbers in Clark County show a growing nonpartisan base. August registration numbers show 499,000 are Democrat, 362,000 are nonpartisan, and 352,000 are Republican. Republican National Committee spokesperson Keith Skipper says a large part of that is due to automatic voter registration at the DMV. We want to make sure that we are uh, getting anyone that identifies with the Republican Party or maybe doesn't know what the Republican Party is to understand what we're about, the uh, limited government, free enterprise, liberty uh, for everyone. There was not a Democrat-affiliated registration booth on the UNLV campus. In a statement, Nevada Democratic Victory says in part, Democrats have and will be focused on ensuring Nevadans are registered to vote and have access to the voting booth from today through Election Day 2022. Kate Houston, live, local, now. So are all those people really nonpartisan, and does that mean candidates will have to reach out more to the middle? John Langler talked with UNLV political science assistant professor Dan Lee about it. The amount of nonpartisan uh, voters is, is quite in large in Nevada right now. What does that say about where the political parties stand right now in Nevada? If, if, if there are so many people that are sort of in the middle, it would seem to suggest maybe that they're not, there's not as much of a connection. What's going on in Nevada as far as party registration kind of matches what's going nationwide as far as long-term trends and changes in partisanship. Where over the past, say like since 2000, right, politics has gotten super polarized, um, hyper-partisan and on Capitol Hill. People are kind of dissatisfied with that type of politics. So what you've seen is growing dissatisfaction with the major parties, and you've seen an increased number of people saying that they're independent. Right. And there's also increased support in theory for a third party. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these independents are actually closet partisans. Right. Where they're, you know, so if you nudge them, you can ask, all right, what party do you identify with? They'll say independent, neither. Then you nudge them and ask them, well, if you have to lean one way, which way would you lean? And a lot of these are actually, they lean either Democrat or Republican and they vote a lot like partisans. Even though people say they're, nonpartisan as you're suggesting they're really not so it does it does it then pay off for a candidate to try and reach that middle if at the end of the day it doesn't that's not it's not as fertile a ground as they would think exactly right so what the parties are going to try to do is find among those nonpartisan which ones are the partisans that lean our way because the true independents, people that say that, they, you know, that are actual true independents and don't lean one way or the other, they're also the people that are least likely to turn out and vote. And kind of one of the big changes that we might see over the next four years is with Sisolak signing that bill where we're switching over to a presidential primary. 
that's going to give incentives for a lot of these independent closet partisans, right, who are right now nonpartisan. That's going to give them an, uh, an incentive to, to uh, register with one of the major parties. If they want to be able to vote in the parties in that primary, the presidential primary in 2024, they have to register with that party to be able to vote in the party's primary. So I think that's one sort of, I guess, correction we're going to see, like movement we're going to see in terms of these registration numbers going into 2024. It's where we're going to see some movement towards um, the major parties, actually. The idea of a growing base of nonpartisan voters in Nevada, that isn't unusual to a state like Nevada, purple, essentially, what you'd say, purple state. Yeah, and it's not unusual just nationwide as well, right? Because, again, there is this growing trend of just more people saying that they're independent, like nationwide, right? Um, whether it's, so it's not just specific to Nevada, but there are like other specific little things to Nevada. Like for instance, you know, we passed that, um, the automatic voter registration law that's, that kicked in, uh, last year. So what that does is, you know, when people do business at a DMV, it, it rather than an opt-in system is an opt-out system. So now people who might otherwise not register to vote are getting registered, right? So who are people that are not who typically wouldn't get registered to vote. People that aren't that interested in politics, those will tend to be nonpartisan voters, right? So that's like also one one change in the past uh, year, year and a half, that's kind of contributed to this increase in partisanship. Um, so that's something that's a bit more specific to Nevada. There are more registered nonpartisans than there are Republicans in Clark County, there's a third party called American Independent in Nevada. It's a far right party, but in theory, it has a lot of people registered for it because they think they're signing up to register as independent instead of with them. So there may be a few more among those. Why? Why? We'll never know the why. Not that it matters. But he took something from us, and I think that's the part that hurts the most. This week, marking four years since the one October shooting here in Las Vegas, Nevada Democrat Dina Titus introducing a bill in the House this week to ban bump stocks. Now, they use a gun's recoil energy to rapidly move the firearm back and forth, bumping the trigger against the finger and simulating fully automatic fire. Now, Stephen Paddock used them to speed up his rate of fire four years ago, allowing him to kill 60 people and injure hundreds more. Titus's plan would require those bump stocks to be registered under the National Firearm. Act. Nevada Senator Catherine Cortez Masto talked about the lasting effects of One October on the Senate floor this week. One October is a lingering presence, one that can return in a rush at the faintest reminder, like the sound of sirens or fireworks. And it was the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history. And afterwards, there was a big push to get rid of those bump stocks. But, Vanessa, that didn't happen four years ago. That's right. The ATF created a federal ban, however, after several lawsuits by gun manufacturers. A federal court ruled in March of this year that the way they did it was unconstitutional and must be put on hold. Congress never passed one on their own. But if they did, that would be a way around that ruling. So we'll see what happens. Welcome back to Politics Now. Top Trump aide Corey Lewandowski under fire this week after accusations of sexual harassment at a high-dollar Las Vegas fundraiser. Lewandowski was removed as chairman of the MAGA Action Political Action Committee. According to Politico, a Trump donor from Idaho is accusing him of sexually assaulting, harassing, and stalking her during a fundraiser last weekend at the Westgate. Lewandowski's local attorney, David Chesnoff, said he wouldn't dignify those accusations with a response. Former Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi is replacing Lewandowski as the head of that MAGA action pack, Vanessa. The Nevada Republican Party and Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman are hoping to get the Republican National Convention to Las Vegas. The next convention will be in 2024. The committee sent a letter asking Goodman to submit a bid, and she said she would. State Party Chairman Michael McDonald is also on the selection committee. Nevada almost hosted the 2020 RNC, 
coming in second to Charlotte. Mayor Goodman said she would also welcome the Democratic National Convention if they wanted to be in Las Vegas. Clark County School District Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara testifying to Congress this week about how our schools handled the pandemic. He also highlighted how federal money helped us navigate through it. Hector Mejia has his testimony. This is the U.S. House of Representatives Virtual Subcommittee on Early Childhood, Elementary, and Secondary Education. Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara told lawmakers CCSD included stakeholders when it came to designing a back to school plan. Including our five bargaining units representing 42,000 employees of the Clark County School District. Together, we instituted a mass mandate and social distancing protocol. However, he said they quickly discovered many students had no internet or cell phones at home. In a matter of weeks, we were able to deploy over 247,000 devices and provide internet access to the students who previously did not have it. CCSD has 304,000 students, more than 70 percent on free or reduced lunches. Dr. Jara also talked about the staff shortages. We need more substitute teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and custodians. All of these vacancies are putting instruction, extracurricular activities, and maintenance of our district assets at risk. Hector Mejia, 8 News Now. You're watching Politics Now. Well, dozens of new laws kicked in on Friday, which was the first of the month. And let's walk you through a couple of them. First, let's talk about pot consumption lounges. We're talking about AB 341. They are officially legal, though they won't open. One won't open until next year. We know of that. AB 101 means a vet can now give your pet CBD products. And then AB 158 gets rid of the prison sentence for underage teens in possession of weed or alcohol. Criminal justice reform, also a big topic this past session. It is now illegal for cops to have quotas for traffic tickets or arrests. Law enforcement agencies have to set up early warning systems to catch bias or problematic officers. And then a separate one requires officers use de-escalation tactics. That was SB 212. Many of those that we saw this past session also aimed at racial divides in policing. Another law banning hairstyle discrimination, AB 157, allowing people to sue if somebody calls the police on them solely on race, religion, or nationality. And then the hate crime law now changed so someone can be charged with it even if they are the same race, religion, or nationality as the victim. AB 327, by the way, that hairstyle discrimination law, Vanessa. Thanks, David. Across the country, states are passing their own abortion restrictions. The latest and most controversial is the Texas bill allowing any citizen to sue for any abortion after six weeks. So will the Supreme Court take up that case? John Langler talked to our Washington, D.C. correspondent, Alexandra Lamone, about it. A lot going on, not only on Capitol Hill in Washington, but also over at the Supreme Court. Alex Limon joining us now to talk about uh, specifically abortion. There was a ruling from the Supreme Court not long ago that uh, obviously got a lot of attention. There is the issue in Texas, the abortion case there. Is it possible that these might get fast-tracked and added back onto the docket? Here's what happened in that case. The Supreme Court just decided not to step in on an emergency basis, essentially, because the case, the law was just barely going to take effect. It hasn't really worked its way through the legal system to the Supreme Court. So it isn't that the Supreme Court, you know, denied to hear it. They just decided not to step in on an emergency basis. But there is a possibility, according to a Georgetown Law Professor that I spoke to, that this case could be fast-tracked through the legal system and end up on the Supreme Court docket this term, even though uh, the court obviously is already hearing the case out of Mississippi that bans abortion after 15 weeks. The Texas case is just so different, um, first of all, because it kicks in at about six weeks or whenever a heartbeat can be detected. So it's much earlier of an abortion ban compared to the Mississippi case, but also because there's just such complex and unique legal questions in that case because uh, it basically tasks ordinary citizens or allows ordinary citizens uh, the power to enforce that law by suing anyone that they think um, provided help to a woman in getting an abortion. Um, they can sue for $10,000. And so the legality of all of that um, is quite complex and quite different than most of the other abortion laws that are working their way up to the courts. So as far as uh, whether that could end up before the Supreme Court this term, it is definitely a possibility. 
Well, certainly the Biden administration and the Justice Department sort of wants, especially that Texas case fast track. They have they've filed their uh, court paperwork. Uh, and they're working on that right away. But is there a hesitancy? Does it seem like on by the Supreme Court to to wade into these very very complex and very controversial subjects? Uh, it doesn't seem like it. Uh, like I said, they are taking that Mississippi case that's already on the docket scheduled to be heard this term. Um, there are also other cases uh, working their way up through the courts. For example, there's a couple of laws that attempt to ban abortion solely on the basis uh, of a Down syndrome diagnosis. And so those are also possibly cases that could end up before the Supreme Court. That was Alex Lamone from Washington, D.C. You're watching Politics Now. This week in What to Watch, Drawing the Lines. The county commission is meeting to talk about how redistricting will go for them. We'll watch their suggestions, and we are still waiting for the special session to be called as well. And Las Vegas also hosting the National Immigrant Integration Conference. It is the largest immigration conference in the country. The Immigration Services Director and lots of politicians will be there. Thanks so much for watching Politics Now. Have a great night.